I am very pleased, I'm proud, I'm honored to be standing here at the place where so many famous scientists, world famous scientists, stood here before me explaining their theories, showing their, their, their experiments. Tonight I'm going to talk about a much more modern topic, namely identities, digital identities, cyber security also a little bit, and uh, I'll show you my outline. Um, <clears throat> I'll start with an introduction, and <clears throat> actually, I can imagine that you maybe don't remember in detail <clears throat> where Nijmegen, the place I come from, is, so I brought a map. <clears throat> it's, <clears throat> it's not a very recent map, <clears throat> it's a map from Roman times, um, <clears throat> from the year 100, roughly, when the Roman Empire was at the height of its uh, uh, power. It, uh, <clears throat> you, you can see England and Wales in Roman hands, but also uh, half of the Netherlands. And at this half, at the border, the Romans founded a city, which they called Novio Magus, the, the uh, biggest city in that area that they founded. It's actually the oldest city in the Netherlands, and that became later Nijmegen. Um, <clears throat> Fast forward, this is Nijmegen Bridge, uh, a landmark bridge, and I'm showing this because this bridge uh, actually played a pretty important role in British history, in British military history. In uh, World War II, <coughs> in 1944, the Allies had landed in France, pushed into Germany, uh, pushed into Belgium, and they tried to conquer the Netherlands also. <coughs> The Netherlands has many rivers and bridges, and they came up, actually, uh, Montgomery came up with a plan to conquer these great bridges uh, in, a, in one operation, one in a row, via airborne troops. The Brits <coughs> sent a division into Arnhem, <coughs> they fought for a week, and uh, they didn't succeed and had to withdraw there. Um, <coughs> the Allies, they did conquer Nijmegen. And so this was the bridge they actually reached. And in this way, an expression came up, the whole plan was one bridge too far. This became the title of a famous book on this, and also a movie, maybe you've seen it. I have two screenshots <coughs> from the movie. Uh, this is the Americans crossing the, the River Waal <coughs> at Nijmegen. And you may recognize this character in, the, in these shots. This is the liberator of Nijmegen, Robert Redford. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, <coughs> once the Americans uh, had uh, <coughs> crossed the bridge, uh, British tanks rolled over, uh, trying to reach their comrades in, uh, in Arnhem, but they were too late. Interestingly, the uh, commander of the first tank that rolled over the bridge was a fairly well-known Englishman, Lord Carrington. Now, for the younger people in the audience, Lord Carrington is not a movie character. <laughs> uh, <laughs> he's best known in the Netherlands as a former Secretary General of NATO. Uh, in the UK, I think he's best known as a uh, foreign office, uh, uh, in a, uh, <coughs> under foreign secretary under Margaret Thatcher. And if I remember correctly, he voluntarily stepped down when the Falklands were invaded. I'm starting with this history, well, to pay my respect <coughs> for people involved, but also uh, all this is about empires and bridges and frontiers, which is very close to my field, computer security. Back to today, <coughs> I'm at this university in the Nijmegen, in Nijmegen, Radboud University, it looks a lot more modern um, <coughs> than the pictures I showed. So I'm a professor of computer security at Nijmegen. Um, <clears throat> when I started studying, computer science was just coming up as a field of study. It was the early 80s. I did mathematics and also philosophy. <clears throat> so I have an, a precise scientific background, but I'm interested in broader issues. I'm a recipient of an ERC <coughs> advanced research grant. Um, 
this is so, the top prize you can win as a, as a scientist in Europe. The ERC is the European Research Council. It gives you five years and 2.5 million euro, which is a substantial amount that scientists can get very excited about. Um, <coughs> I'm, uh, I dare to claim a publicly visible academic in the Netherlands. <laughs> Um, so I'm uh, uh, frequently in the media, sometimes also abroad, and uh, I'm fairly active in social debates and on privacy, on, on security, on intelligence also sometimes, and uh, here it helps that I have this philosophy, philosophy background. <coughs> so more blah blah. I'm an uh, advisor to government in uh, various uh, roles and boards and capacities, uh, but I will not bore you with this much more. So my area is computer security. <coughs> um, what is computer security about? Anyone? Anyone? Mm -hmm. Sorry? Protection. Protection information. Very good, very good. My favorite description is this one. It's about regulating access to assets. <clears throat> I like this because of this access to assets, the, the, the alliteration involved. Um, <clears throat> so what are the assets? They can be uh, company secrets or government secrets uh, 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 or, or also personal information. So privacy is part of the field in the technical sense, just about protecting some kind of information. But uh, also, there are lots of other issues to privacy, which I will discuss today. <coughs> now, regulating is an important part of this. Um, um, suppose, <coughs> suppose I want to uh, protect some information. I can put it in a vault and dump this vault on the bottom of the ocean. And I've certainly protected it in a specific way, but I have not regulated access to it in a very convenient way. And computer security is about this regulation. So you want the good guys to get to it, <coughs> but not the bad guys. Uh, and immediately the question comes up, who are the good guys, who are the bad guys? Who are we dealing with anyway? So identity is, is you could say, the starting point of many uh, security solutions. <coughs> good. Implicitly in my field, there's often an attacker. We think in terms of an attacker who's trying to undermine the, the systems that we're trying to protect in, uh, in my area. If I speak to managers, <coughs> and I have to explain what my area is about, I use, often use the following image. <coughs> you have assets, the things you want to protect. You have certain threats against these assets and you have controls. Now the assets, it's often already difficult for organizations to try and find out what are precisely the assets that we have. What are the assets of the BBC? What are the assets of a, of a university? Well, the, the research results before they are published, but personal data of staff, personal data of students, but they could be student marks. Let's say student marks as an example. What are the threats against student marks? What are the possible attackers? <laughs> Is it Russian intelligence? Well, maybe not. It's probably students themselves. How do we rate them as at attackers? Uh, well, students typically have limited resources, uh, but they usually have a lot of patience, and they are, they are clever. Uh, so, so you have to organize your controls in relation to the assets and, and to the threats that you perceive. This requires a form of analysis, which is often called risk-based analysis. Computer security is a hot topic. <clears throat> was already mentioned in the introduction. Um, modern societies, it's a cliche, were highly dependent on uh, digital technology, but at the same time, that makes us vulnerable. Um, <clears throat> via failures, they may be intended or unintended, in my field, we're specifically interested in the intended failures by the bad guys. Uh, and cybercrime, cyber, crime, cyber espionage, warfare <coughs> is all part of this field in a wider context. Nowadays, also, uh, we've learned that the whole cyber area is very 
very fragile <coughs> for, for not only uh, commercial manipulation, but also political manipulation. Facebook <coughs> um, um, <coughs> is the, the, the main example here. Uh, I think a, a British parliamentary report described them this, way, this week as digital gangsters. Uh, that's something. Uh, <coughs> I mean, Facebook was designed basically as a manipulation network, but primarily for commercial manipulation. And we've seen over the last few years that it could also be used effectively for political manipulation. Certainly in the US, maybe also here in the UK, I don't want to go into these sensitivities, but certainly it's a hot topic. And defense in this area is much more difficult <coughs> than uh, attack. As an attacker, you only have to find one hole. As a defender, you have to plug all the holes. Um, <clears throat> um, what makes it difficult is that most people are strongly focused on functionality. What are the nice things you can do with computers? That's what they typically present. In my area, we focus on the nasty things you can do with uh, computers. Very few people do this, too, too few people, <coughs> I would say. You see this clearly in the Internet of Things. This is this development that all kinds of devices get hooked up to the internet, from your toothbrush to your fridge to your washing machine. God knows why, but that happens. And all these devices are observing and sending information out into the cloud to some provider a company you don't know. Uh, the software quickly gets outdated on these uh, devices. They, they, <coughs> the margins are very small. The producers don't want to maintain this. And you're left very quickly with a very vulnerable device. So a big question is, <coughs> can, we, can we defend, <coughs> can we protect what we build? And to be honest, the answer is no. Uh, Nijmegen has a particular history in this uh, area that I briefly want to recall uh, to you because maybe you recognize something. In 2008, uh, colleagues of mine, and I was closely involved in the whole process here, we discovered uh, security flaws in the chip card called MyFair Classic. Now you may not know the name MyFair Classic, but you surely know Oyster cards, and Oyster cards had precisely this chip in it. Um, we could manipulate the chip in such a way that we could top up the amounts on these cards uh, without any corresponding payment. Now, this uh, sounds very attractive, of course. This, uh, <laughs> we behaved quite ethically, I can, can assure you. Um, this was a very big thing in the press, uh, but actually the real dangers were behind this because these cards were also used as entry cards to banks and to military bases and to government departments. Uh, uh, as I say here, uh, around 1 billion copies had been sold. Not all of them were at, in use at that stage, but really hundreds and hundreds of millions of cards had to be replaced. Uh, what we did when we found the, the vulnerabilities, we went to the card producer, which was a Dutch company called NXP, <coughs> and we said, we have a, you have a problem, this is what it is, and we will publish it in, in six months uh, to make sure that you do something about it. They said, thank you very much, we'll take you to court. <coughs> and we ask a publication ban. So they went to a, uh, to a judge, <coughs> uh, and this is remarkable, uh, asked for a scientific publication to be suppressed. Uh, the Dutch uh, uh, judge was uh, <coughs> wise, according to my view, and said, no, you won't get the publication ban on this, and, and after half a year we published this, and no major disasters happened. It was a big lesson for the whole world. <laughs> it was covered on BBC, TV at the time. <laughs> uh, <coughs> yeah. Uh, some five years later, we discovered uh, vulnerabilities in chips that were used in, in car mobilizers. Nowadays, modern cars, you can start by just putting, pushing a button, but there's a chip, uh, usually in your pocket, or you have to plug it in somewhere that communicates with the car. We analyzed the communication, we analyzed the chip again. <laughs> as we would say in the field, uh, rather stupid mistakes were made. <coughs> uh, again, we informed the whole sector. We said we were published in, uh, in uh, half a year. Uh, many, many car brands were uh, affected, including Volkswagen. <coughs> Volkswagen, this was before the time they really got a bad reputation uh, for other reasons. 
uh, with this case, they got a bad reputation in our view, but uh, that's a different matter. They, they took us to court, but what happened? There were three researchers at Nijmegen that had done this work. And in the meantime, one of them had moved to Birmingham. And Volkswagen knew that in the, in the Netherlands, they had no chance of getting a publication ban. But because one of the researchers was in Birmingham, they had legal basis to go to an English court. Now, the English court system, the legal system, works quite differently from the Dutch system. And an English law actually imposed, uh, English judge imposed a publication ban. I can still get excited about this uh, in a negative sense. <laughs> Uh, this is a big thing, eh? a, ju uh, uh, a judge uh, forbidding a scientific publication. Uh, it lasted for roughly two years, then Volkswagen got fed up with the whole negative publicity and they, got, uh, uh, they basically lifted the ban. <coughs> Some uh, months ago, we published another thing, big thing, uh, about vulnerabilities in memory chips, so-called solid-state drives. Uh, uh, we went through a process, like in all these cases, we notified the producers. In this uh, case, there was also a big one like Samsung was involved. And uh, um, <clears throat> this went smoothly from a legal perspective. We published this and, and the manufacturers knew this well in advance. This was also covered by BBC Click on the radio, and that's where Gareth was involved. The same thing, of course, in all of this is that the world and these producers got used to these kind of flaws. <clears throat> By the way, we also do positive things in Nijmegen, and not just destructive, and I'll tell a bit about that later. I, I like to, this, this whole affair, <coughs> this, especially this, this publication ban here in, the, in, the, in London was extensively covered by the British press in a rather chauvinistic way, I'd like to say, and I, I'd like to give you an impression of this, uh, just for fun. I'm, I'm not offended anymore. But So the Guardian wrote about this after the, uh, <coughs> the ban was lifted. They also wrote it about, about it in print, but I couldn't get hold of a copy anymore. So I, I have this from their website. Uh, as I said, one of the re researchers <coughs> moved to, to Birmingham and uh, was mentioned in the article <laughs> Explicitly, I have a quote here, I hope you can read it. Flavio Garcia from Birmingham University and two other researchers from a Dutch university. <laughs> <laughs> I must be honest, they did mention Nijmegen a bit later on, but you, you can imagine that the researchers involved felt a bit uh, unhappy about this. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> let's go to some more uh, serious things. Warfare is going digital. I don't want to go too deeply into it. Just some pictures, a picture that says it all. <clears throat> this is about the attack on the Iranian uh, nuclear installation. It has now become clear that this has been carried out jointly by the US and Israel. Israel. And the, the uh, <coughs> interesting thing about this is that, that digital warfare has become a a sort of uh, uh, weak form of warfare where you don't go into physical action, but you, these countries manage to stay below the radar for a long time. And this is a new form of conflict that is emerging and that we as a world have to deal with. Um, painting history <coughs> with a very broad brush, uh, you can say the following thing. The First World War was the war of the chemists with the horrible gases. The Second World War was a war of the physicists with the atomic bomb, and the Third World War, if ever, <laughs> it will be a war of a computer scientist. Um, this is something you can say for sure, at least at this stage. Let me take <coughs> a, a broader societal uh, perspective. Um, if you want to understand uh, power relations in society, uh, the saying used to be, follow the money. Follow the money. This is very clear from uh, this uh, movie, All President's Man, where, where Nixon, uh, uh, Nixon team broke into the Democratic headquarters. This was unraveled by uh, Washington Post journalists by following the money. That's the, the key theme in that movie. 
As you can see from this clip, maybe you recognize the, the liberator of Nijmegen, <laughs> Robert, <laughs> Robert Redford. This is a coincidence. You might start to think I'm a big fan of him. I'm not, but... <laughs> <laughs> okay, but nowadays, my main point, I had a serious point here, <laughs> which, is, which is maybe escaping now. The main, main point is here, if you nowadays want to understand so, uh, power in society, you have to follow the data. That is the guide to power relations. And big IT companies have understood this like no other. Google is into uh, driving these days. Not so much like that they, they like cars, uh, and car mechanics, but they just want to get more data about us, where we go, at what time, where we stop, etc., etc. That's the whole thing. And we call computer security about regulating access to assets and data are assets. So it's very close to power relations in society. Um, also, the last bullet is a, is a very fundamental point. In our societies, we have many rules and regulations by now to control the flow of money, but not so much about, basically none, about the flow of, uh, of data. And this is uh, one of the underlying themes also now in the discussion in the UK about Facebook. Uh, what's the role of computer scientists in all this? <clears throat> well, again, the traditional view is uh, computer scientists are the architects uh, of the digital world. Fair enough, fair enough. Uh, but I think it's more justified to say these days that they have become the architects of the social world. If you look at the impact of systems like Facebook and how they, they are organized and how data is controlled in these kind of systems and how this influences people's lives, <coughs> Uh, we have to look, as computer scientists, and this is a, an appeal also to my own community, we have to look beyond the technicalities of our own field. And this social <coughs> aspect and also this responsibility is very big in the area of digital identity about which I want to talk now. Good. <coughs> um, when is identity needed? I'll, I'll uh, mention a few examples uh, to you. Uh, for online banking, <laughs> if you do online banking, well, first of all, if you log in, the bank wants to know for sure who you are, so that it shows you the appropriate account and not for so someone else. So you have to prove as a user who you are. Now, this is called authentication in my field. Authentication is proving who you are. Um, in principle, each transaction also has to be signed, digitally signed, so that's clear that you gave the order to transfer this kind of money. Uh, now, authentication is reasonably well uh, regulated these days, but signing not so much. Uh, it's, not, it's not part of our infrastructure. Another example, if you want to buy alcohol, in most countries you have to be over 18. <coughs> um, um, what's the policy in a supermarket? you have to show your passport, at least in the Netherlands, or your ID. I don't know precisely how that happens in the, in the UK, what, what you have to show. Uh, but, uh, and the, the rules in general, if you look under 25, they'll ask. <coughs> but suppose now you want to buy alcohol online, and the, the shop, the off-license, the online off-license asks you to upload a copy of your passport. Would you do this for buying a bottle of wine? I see some people shaking and happy. No, why not? Why not? And the reason is that it's a complete overkill. <laughs> you show them so much information, which can be abused in all kinds of ways, and the only, only relevant part, piece of information you have to transfer to them is, I'm over 18. This is what I'll call an attribute, and I'll talk about this a bit more. It's a small piece of information about you. When you open an account on Facebook, <coughs> Um, I'm not into Facebook bashing, although that's very popular and easy to uh, this day, but I'm looking at this more seriously now. Uh, when you open an account of, on Facebook, um, I'm, I'm sure many of you have done so, what kind of information did you provide? Well, Facebook asks uh, for your name, your date of birth, your, your uh, email address, maybe some more uh, information, gender probably. Um, <coughs> Facebook has a, has a real name policy. 
it says, the policy says, you should provide your real name. Do they have a way of checking? No. Uh, but why do they demand this? Uh, first of all, the fact that they don't have a way of checking is interesting, but still they want you to do this. Uh, anyone an idea why they want you to use your real name? Yeah? Yeah, but uh, I could have given your name. Yeah, but I, I could have used uh, uh, some, uh, some uh, nonsense name, and if they saw that something went wrong with this nonsense name, they simply blocked the account of this nonsense name. Uh, so, so that is not uh, the point. Any idea? Any idea? Close, close, closer. <clears throat> um, you probably know that Facebook has a login option also. If you want to go to some of your favorite newspaper, it may have Facebook login. So Facebook wants to, to uh, present itself to the world as an identity provider. Uh, if you want to know who someone is, trust Facebook. I heard today that in the UK it's possible to log into the tax office uh, the Inland Revenue Service, let's say, uh, with Facebook. Uh, I, I see some amazement here. In the Netherlands, this would be impossible. People would not accept this, that you go to a public uh, service using such a private company with such many side interests. Anyway, uh, identity is at stake, very sensitive here. Um, uh, the UK has this, this gov.uk verify program. Who has enlisted for this? Who has an identity? One, two, three. Oh, not too bad. Okay, okay. I was just curious. I don't know too much about it. Um, I'll come back about, uh, to the UK situation soon. <clears throat> so one thing to look at briefly is real world against virtual identity. <laughs> um, in daily life, we often uh, rely on context <coughs> when it comes to identity. If I go to a hospital and I see someone in a white coat, I'm, I'm, I'm quickly thinking that's a doctor or a nurse. Or a, uh, The authentication level is very weak. It's easy to cheat. I, can, I could walk into a hospital myself wearing such a white coat. And probably people would start uh, talking, telling me all kinds of medical details. Um, still, this works reasonably well, <laughs> because you go into a hospital, big building, it says hospital, etc. The context uh, gives away lots of information. Online <laughs> is completely different. <laughs> it's, it's very difficult, uh, uh, almost impossible, to give a reliable context online. Uh, I could make a website saying hospital. <laughs> well, I could say, make a website saying Barclays Bank. Uh, and maybe people start typing in their passwords then. So how do you know for sure uh, 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 identity and, and, and context online? That's a, that's a very big issue. I like to recall in that context this cartoon. <coughs> please, the cartoon is of course very funny, but uh, please note the year. This is 1993. Uh, and and uh, at that stage, people still thought they could be reasonably anonymous online. By now, this picture is completely wrong. So I have a correction from 2010, which is this. <laughs> 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 I hope you can read the small print says, how does Facebook know I'm a dog? <laughs> well, how, how does Facebook know? I mean, uh, profiling. <laughs> There's this uh, identity behind the computer behaved like a dog. Probably went to dog food websites. <laughs> so, no, I'm joking, but you get the point. Uh, more seriously, uh, let's look at history again. Napoleon played a very important role in this, in this area. <laughs> Here he is, not looking very happy. Uh, uh, Napoleon introduced, in the countries that he conquered, national citizen uh, uh, registration systems. And he did that uh, because he needed people for his armies. He needed draft uh, registrations for, for, for draft. <clears throat> this never happened in Anglo-Saxon countries. And this is a very, very big fundamental difference, uh, which is fascinating. Uh, 
people in continental Europe, they're used to going to the, the government or to their municipality, and they have a reliable registration of these of people. Um, and people so see the, the, the government as a source of identity. <coughs> in the Anglo-Saxon world, that, that doesn't exist. Um, so, so if you have to prove who you are, you have to bring a library card or an energy bill or a phone bill or whatever. And on the continent, we look at this and how is this possible? <laughs> and uh, um, in the US, it's the same. Uh, probably the driver's license there is the most reliable form of identification, but it's even different per state. Now, I dare to make a, a, a claim had this chap, Napoleon, not gone east into Russia, but had he gone west and conquered Britain, I don't think there would have been a Brexit. <laughs> 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 because it's really how you look at the role of government, of institutions. And so, of course, it's a, it's a joke, but I think there is some level of truth in, in, in this, what I'm saying. Okay, so uh, I've been talking about uh, Britain and the continent. Uh, that's the only Brexit joke I'll make tonight. <laughs> uh, um, but there are subtle differences between other countries. <laughs> so Germany and, and, uh, and uh, Great Britain don't have national identification numbers. Uh, Britain doesn't have it because you Brits are, as I like to call, identity anarchists. Um, <clears throat> What about the Germans? The Germans are a very, very uh, well-organized uh, 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 country. Why don't they have a national identification number? Well, they have a rather sensitive history of abuse of state power. So, so this is impossible in, in Germany to have. Again, you see how identity is subtly related to power, the relation between power <coughs> of, of state and individuals. The Netherlands does have a national identification number. It's called BSN for the people with the Dutch background <coughs> here in the audience. But we have some sort of compromise that it's, uh, you can only use it in the public uh, setting and not in a private setting. Why not in a private setting? <coughs> well, if companies are allowed to use such a number, they can register it for each transaction, everything you buy or, or buy online, and they can combine all these transactions and build up together a, a very extensive profile of, uh, of people. So there are actually subtle reasons uh, behind this. Scandinavian countries, <coughs> they do have national uh, identification numbers, but they can be used both in the public and the private sector. So Scandinavian countries have a high trust factor, um, and uh, things work differently there. <coughs> so what I'm going to focus on is, is these differences in, in uh, identities. And here, attributes come up. What are attributes? Attributes are properties of people. <coughs> so let me mention some examples. Your given name, your family name, uh, your physical address, your email address, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, so these are, are examples of attributes. Uh, <clears throat> your medical dossier—that's too big. That's not an attribute. Your tax form, uh, your uh, your tax dossier—it's also not an attribute. Attributes are used for authentication, for proving who you who you are. Uh, some attributes are identifying, <coughs> your, like your passport number. Uh, that identifies you, certainly in a, uh, within a country, or student number within a university. But some, some attributes are non-identifying, like your gender, um, <clears throat> or the fact that you're older than 18. Uh, maybe you want to uh, <clears throat> play some hefty game online. Again, it suffices to prove that you're over 16 or 18 or whatever. Um, attributes typically have a certain validity period. It depends on the attribute, but the the fact that you're younger than 15 <coughs> stops being valid at some stage, at least if you lo live long enough, um, <coughs> or your address may change also at, uh, at some stage. Uh, right? so, so attributes, there's a certain dynamics in it. Um, what is your identity now? Now, I don't want to get too philosophical, but from a technical pr perspective, you can say your identity is simply the collection of attributes that hold for you at a particular point in time. That is a workable definition from a technical perspective. 
And uh, the basic idea behind using attributes is that authority, authorization <coughs> can be done based on, on attributes. <coughs> For instance, you can participate in a certain, what is it, uh, discussion group because you're younger than 15 or because you're a student in a certain class. You don't have to identify who you, yourself who you are, but that suffices to participate, maybe. This gives new forms of functionality, which may be very useful. Uh, uh, and very much in contrast to the way Facebook would do these kind of things. And uh, the traditional way of, of uh, 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 that identity based is, uh, uh, identity is based on some national registration number doesn't work in such a context because the relevant information is that someone is under 15. Um, <clears throat> the selection of these attributes <coughs> for authentication should be minimal <coughs> according to the GDPR. The GDPR is the General Data Protection Regulation that's in force in Europe since almost a year. Um, good. <clears throat> um, and uh, you can show different attributes in different contexts. <clears throat> so if you order a book online, you have to prove what your address is for delivery and what your bank account number is for, for payment, but that's it, basically. Well, maybe if you're over 16, if it's a certain kind of book, but okay. Um, <clears throat> now, what we have built in, in uh, Nijmegen is an app <clears throat> called the Irma app, which allows you to collect in this app attributes about yourself. It's sort of a personal passport on your phone that, uh, where you can collect these kind of things. Um, <clears throat> the attributes are stored only on the phone. They are digitally signed, uh, so their, their source is, uh, is, is reliable, it's visible. Uh, there are uh, is some deep cryptography behind this that uh, uh, <coughs> that's our, uh, our main, main line of work. And it's uh, freely available and open source. And I'm, I'm going to do a very dangerous thing. Namely, I'm going to give a live demo of this. <laughs> And uh, what I have here, if it works, is a website of the foundation behind uh, this IMA project. And on the right, I'm, I'm mirroring my phone. So what I do on my phone here, you can see on the screen. <coughs> I've just opened the app. Now I have to type in a pin. And I trust you all, but this is going on the web. <laughs> so um, I do like this for a moment. The, <coughs> uh, pin is being checked online, the app opens and uh, shows if the connection is not broken, uh, some attributes of me. <coughs> Again, because I'm, uh, this is going online, I'm, being, I'm a bit cautious about what I'm uh, showing here because I, I don't <coughs> want to get into trouble here. Uh, so my phone number is here, I'm not going to show it. <laughs> uh, there's some Twitter information from here. Uh, my BSN is in here. This is this national citizen identification in, uh, number. My bank information, not going to show. Uh, Servnet, uh, that's uh, information from the university, I'm not going to show. I'm going to show you my age limits. <laughs> I'm over 12, 16, 18. <laughs> <laughs> but not yet over 65. <laughs> but other things cont really contain my home address, my, uh, 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 etc. It's sensitive things which I've collected uh, in this uh, app. Now, how is this app used? Well, there are some, uh, on the website of this foundation, there are some demos. You can try them at home if you like uh, later. And uh, uh, they're like a student check and an 18 plus check. There's also, uh, this is my favorite, it's a, it's a privacy friendly Netflix. So here, here you can watch movies online. <coughs> and uh, uh, here, for this movie, you have to be over 12. Uh, for this one, there's no age limit. Uh, this one's 12, there's uh, no age limit. Here is a more hefty one, that's 16 you have to, uh, to be. Okay, let's, because also uh, this is going online, let's do uh, not the, uh, <laughs> let's do an innocent one. Suppose, <coughs> suppose I uh, want to uh, watch this movie. <coughs> How do the attributes from my phone get to this website? Well, I clicked the movie, uh, a QR code comes up that I can scan my phone. You can see this is live. Uh, I'll scan it here on my computer. And please watch my screen. <coughs> 
It's a little bit slow because I'm tunneling everything through my phone, <coughs> which is using roaming, uh, but it can, can work a bit better. It asked me to, to reveal just one thing, that I'm a member of this club. I say, okay, I'm willing to reveal this. I'm not showing which member I am, and then the movie starts. <coughs> um, okay. <laughs> Although it's very interesting, I'm going to stop this. <laughs> Um, I get, it's also, let's say, an 18 plus check. <clears throat> so this is, there's some uh, the text around explaining what's going on. I can uh, prove that I'm over 18 in the same way. I'll do it quickly because you see how it works. I'll go to scan this. Yeah, I get a request. Uh, do I want to reveal that I'm over 18? Um, I can do it in two ways even. Uh, I say yes. <laughs> And the website shows me some access to some game, uh, which is rated over 18. Now, I understand this is a, 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 a very hot topic in the UK because uh, certain websites have to uh, include age checks at this stage. Here is the technology. <coughs> you can use this. It's freely available. Um, be my guest. <coughs> I'm going to show you some, something else. Um, uh, you can also uh, put signatures. I'll show you how this works, uh, simply by demonstrating it, and then I'll explain as we go on. This website asks me to sign something, <coughs> and I do this by first scanning a QR code. Come on, yeah. And now please look at the phone. <coughs> So I'm, <coughs> I'm asked to sign a certain statement, and I'm signing this using certain attributes. My name, my full name, uh, the fact that I'm from Radboud University, uh, my email address is included here, and the fact that I'm employee here. I say, okay, I'm willing to sign this. Uh, now the website gets this statement in signed form. There is a cryptographic object behind this, uh, which can be processed in the university administration as proof that I really signed this. This is very powerful technology, because instead of signing this as a member of the university, a doctor can sign this in capacity as a doctor, using attributes of being a doctor, even a registration number as a doctor, etc. I hope you get the point. If you have uh, further questions, I propose we postpone them to the to the end, um, I'll go on. So this is the idea of this Irma app. <coughs> you, your phone is your hub, you collect attributes from certain sources and you can then use it again in other sources, uh, for, for other purposes. Um, how did this come about? Well, uh, it started some 10 years ago at the university as a research project. Uh, Several people worked on this, several people did a PhD on this. Uh, we, we built prototypes, working first on a smart card, then on, on a phone. And after some years, I thought, well, it's such a cute technology. Maybe it's good if the, this, this can be rolled out actually, <laughs> actually in the real world. So I set up a foundation, non-profit foundation, uh, called Privacy by Design. <coughs> and it runs this infrastructure now. Uh, it uh, uh, offers the app in more professional uh, form, and it, uh, uh, we see that the Netherlands attribute verification pilots are emerging. A question I sometimes get is why a foundation? Why not a company? Why didn't you try, don't you try to become very, very, very rich with this uh, acute technology? Well, <laughs> to avoid conflict of interest. As I said, I'm sometimes in the news, sometimes in sensitive advice roles, and I don't want to come into a situation that I'm being accused of, you say this because you have this commercial interest there and there. It's not worth it. <coughs> um, a more s <coughs> deep reason is that user acceptance <coughs> uh, often works with open technology. Uh, as I said, people in the Netherlands will never accept logging into the tax office with Facebook. Uh, it should be done in a, in a more open, transparent uh, way. Um, <clears throat> the, another reason, more strategic reason, 
if you look at the strategy of big IT companies, what they often do is buy up innovative uh, uh, companies early on, either incorporate the technology into their own workings or kill the technology if it's threatening their own business. Now, if you're a foundation, it's not so easy to be bought up uh, by big IT. Uh, we won a couple of prizes for this. <coughs> uh, uh, some privacy awards, some internet innovation awards, some Brouwer prize. The prize in the middle is from the maybe the Dutch equivalent of the Royal Institution. What's very nice about the prize in the middle is that it came with 100,000 euro, which is useful for a foundation like ours. The juries generally appreciated this fact <coughs> that it had a solid basis, and uh, etc. Um, when you start a new identity system like this, <coughs> there is a chicken and egg problem described here. Websites are not going to use it if there are no users, and users are not going to install the app if there are no websites. How do you solve this? Well, as a foundation, we decided to solve the chicken problem first, to make sure there is this app that it can be filled with attributes and then work on the eggs later. Now, we are now clearly in this egg state, uh, certainly in the, in the Netherlands. Which sectors are then uh, leading there? <coughs> Just to give you an impression, municipalities. <coughs> uh, it comes really bottom up. Uh, it's not picked up by national government, uh, for, for uh, interesting reasons, probably because it's outside their control. <laughs> uh, they, they find that very uneasy. Uh, but uh, uh, local governments, uh, they have a different attitude. Um, local governments have connected this IRMA system to the national registration system for, for citizens in the Netherlands called Basisregistratie. This is really a strategic breakthrough because it means that we can have really reliable government-level uh, attributes in this uh, system. In healthcare, we also see that companies are picking this up now very quickly, <coughs> uh, for both for patients and for medical staff, because both patients and staff can log in with this system, but also they can both sign with it. And so patients often have to sign for consent, and uh, medical staff, they have to sign orders for recipes, etc. I'll show you a little bit about this. Education is also a sector that's active in this. Web shops, the commercial sectors are a bit slower in this, um, but because they see there are the, this, uh, um, they see the system as slightly too complicated. But they will follow, I, I'm sure. Um, I'll flash you some websites just to give you an um, impression. Uh, this is on the city of Nijmegen. I'm very proud that Nijmegen as a city is also active in this area. So they open up the, the, the citizen administration for everyone in the Netherlands. You have to log in with DigiD. Dutch people will recognize this. This is the government authentication system. And then the, the city puts these attributes in your phone and puts a digital signature on it. Um, this is from an uh, ICT company in healthcare. <coughs> They've built a portal for doctors where you can exclusively log in with, with IRMA. This is now being used by dozens of doctors, but they're planning to scale to hundreds uh, before the summer and to thousands before the end of the year. Um, it's part of a consortium of ICT companies in healthcare that try to do things in a more open way. Uh, here is a, a, a patient portal. <coughs> you see on the left, traditional login, username, uh, password-based, but in the middle, they have the, the option to also do it with the IRMA, and they call it secure login, and I'm very happy with this. Okay, <coughs> let me switch to uh, <coughs> uh, uh, another important topic. <coughs> so far, I've talked about attributes mostly. Uh, they work better than identities. That's uncontroversial, certainly in the area that I work in, identity management. But what is more controversial is, suppose we decide to, to use attributes, where do we store them? And how do the information flows work? I'll sketch you this schematically, and I'll distinguish two approaches, one called centralized and called, uh, the other decentralized. <clears throat> the centralized approach is what Facebook uses. So I've simplified, oversimplified things. There's a user, there are some verifiers. Think of web shops where the user wants to log in. 
And there is an organization that has attributes about you. Think of Facebook. So as a user, I want to go to a website. I want to log in there. <clears throat> and uh, how does Facebook login work? You get redirected to this Facebook to attribute the, uh, provider. You log in there. You authenticate. Then this provider tells the website who you are. <clears throat> OK. If you go to another website, again, you have to log in here. And again, it tells you at that website who you are, etc. What is the crucial point? Everything goes via this attribute provider. This is uh, uh, a sensitive model. It's commercially interesting because the attribute provider can charge, can start charging for each login. And that's what various organizations in this area do. Banks, for instance, in the Netherlands, also in Scandinavia. They typically, in the Netherlands, charge in the order of 25 euro cents per login to be paid by the web shop. That's a substantial amount. Facebook does this for free. Why does Facebook do it for free? For the data. For the data. They can see where we go online so that they can build up even more extensive profiles of us. Now, how does the decentralized model work? This is how IRMA is organized. You, as a user, first go to such an identity, uh, attribute provider, and you collect the number of attributes yourself. You put them on your phone. And if you go to a verifier, you show them. You go to another verifier, you show them again. No one else is involved. There are data flow issues involved <laughs> that have to do with power and control. Uh, ask yourself which system, the centralized of the, or the decentralized one, is the favorite of the Chinese government? <laughs> yeah. Uh, which is the favorite of the Dutch government? Actually, this DigiD system is, it can be used exclusively in the public sector. It's also centralized. How does gov.uk verify work? Who knows? Yeah? Yeah, it's a central hub in the middle. I haven't studied all details, but there's a hub in the middle run by the government. So the government sees about everyone where you log in online, including in the private sector if it's, if it's used there. OK, well, <clears throat> all this is highly politically sensitive. <clears throat> <clears throat> to repeat some points again, information flows and authentication requirements determine power relations in society. If I can force you to authenticate before you come to my gate, I have some control over you. The choice in architecture is highly sensitive. <clears throat> there are substantial differences between the central approach and the decentralized approach. And power and financial control are the key aspect of this central approach. And privacy and autonomy are leading values in this decentralized approach. And a basic question is, what kind of society do we want to live in? Um, it's an urgent question, really. I think this is an urgent question. But also, who makes these choices? <clears throat> do you think politicians are aware of these kind of sen sensitivities? Well, certainly not in the Netherlands. <clears throat> I think they should. But it doesn't work like this. And again, let me reiterate my point. Computer scientists are the architects of the social world. It determines the power relations in societies. Let me make this a bit broader. The world's platforms, again, I'll use a big brush, and I'll compare <coughs> US, Europe, and China. US, we all know these platforms. They de determine our lives to a large, <coughs> large extent. <coughs> what do we have on the Chinese side? We have Baidu, Alibaba, Tencent, collectively often called BOT. They are really dominating Chinese, uh, uh, the lives of Chinese people. What do we have in Europe? Which global platform do we have in Europe? Anyone? Spotify, very good. It's the only one. <laughs> it's the only one we can think of. <coughs> I can think of. This is a bit of a worrying slide. <coughs> what are we doing wrong in Europe? <coughs> Well, let's focus on the US-Chinese agenda a bit. <coughs> there is no, uh, uh, this is my analysis of a joint agenda. Both, both, and both of them are very much interested in controlling digital identities. They wish to know precisely who does what, when, where, online. 
and their goal is to build up detailed profiles. <coughs> the US platforms, they have mostly commercial motives in this. <coughs> Let's be fairly clear about this. But also, we've seen it can be used for political manipulation too. Yeah. <coughs> the Chinese platforms are really intertwined with state power. <coughs> Uh, and they're, they're instruments of the state. Uh, I don't know if you're following these developments about social credit scores in, in uh, China that allow you to, to, to take a plane or to go to university or whatever. That's all integrated with these platforms. <coughs> and all these platforms, they work on the basis of unique identifiers, not attributes, unique identifiers, so that they can precisely follow what people are doing where <coughs> online. Cambridge Analytica. <coughs> I have to mention it in this context. Um, I think a widely shared sentiment, at least in Europe, uh, is we need another kind of IT infrastructure for, the, for this. Um, <coughs> one in which European values are embedded. Okay, we can discuss about what European values uh, uh, are here. I don't want to go deeply into this world, but I, I hope you get the idea here. Um, people are talking more about value-driven design, <coughs> which is the M I think is. <coughs> and ultimately, this is a geopolitical matter. Uh, developments in the US are driven by the commercial sector, in, the, in China by state power. What in Europe? What can we put uh, in this framework? And maybe civil society should take a stronger role in this in Europe. This is my point I'm trying to put forward here. Uh, Irma, I'm proposing in that sense. <laughs> what is the international dimension of it? <laughs> um, there are by now some f more than 5,000 registrations of the app worldwide. We keep on our website a, web, a, a page where we, we can log where, in which countries people have registered for the app. Not just installed it, but registered. Um, in the Netherlands, that has 90% of the registrations, the use stage is now coming up. In the rest of the world, the app cannot really be used. But still, uh, uh, quite a few people installed it and uh, just to try out the technology. It's worldwide available. Um, and the decentralized approach makes it very suitable for international usage. If you go to another country, you have the attributes on your phone and you want to show them there, all that that country needs is public keys. It gets a little bit technical maybe now, but some open source and some open source software. And again, my main point here, one of my main points is that attributes can really reflect different cultures, different cultures with respect to identity. And these differences are substantial. The Facebooks of this world, they want to impose one number, one global number, so that they can track us. Uh, uh, Irma is more uh, for diversity. Um, uh, uh, <coughs> this came up in the Netherlands. How are we going doing this internationally? Not very well. We're not concentrating on this. We're a small foundation. Our, our aim is to get it up and running in the Netherlands uh, first, and then countries will probably get interested. But it's available in other countries. But in order to expand to, let's say, Germany, we need a connection to German citizen registration numbers to get attributes, reliable sources of attributes. So this will probably, expansion will probably go in a hop-by-hop -hop basis. What attributes are available now worldwide that you can use? Email address, you can put already in it. You can uh, uh, get uh, attributes from social media. They're not reliable. <coughs> Also from Edugain International University context to some extent, mobile phone numbers we support in the, in the EU. But again, they are not high assurance attributes. Um, still, it's already useful. Uh, websites can base login just on email attributes <coughs> that you allow uh, people to log in if they can disclose what their email is. Then these websites don't have to manage passwords anymore themselves, which is already a big gain. They can also do signing. <coughs> and <coughs> here in the, con in the UK, I do have some contacts. I'm uh, talking uh, to companies like Digimi and Yoti. And uh, what's interesting in the UK, uh, UK context, because the UK is such an identity anarchy, you can slowly add a number of attributes in your phone. And if you have sufficiently many and they are consistent, another attribute can be added, giving you a higher level of assurance. Roughly 
the way enrollment now works for gov.uk uh, gov uh, verified program. <clears throat> At the end, I want to say a few things about privacy because that's uh, sort of the elephant in the room. What is privacy? What is it? <clears throat> it's very hard to explain, but uh, my favorite author in this field is an uh, American slash South African philosopher, Helen Nissenbaum, and she, she emphasizes the idea of context. <laughs> so we all live in different contexts, like at work, at, uh, at, <clears throat> at home, in a sports club, uh, in church, maybe wherever. And typically, we disclose different things about ourselves in different contexts. When you tell you to your doctor, you don't want to pop up in a supermarket. And when it does pop up in the supermarket, people really get upset. And Helen Nissenbaum calls this in a, a nice way that contextual integrity is broken. <clears throat> and this is the, the essential unease that we can have about privacy violations. And when you explain it like this, my experience is that everybody's in, everybody's in favor of, uh, of uh, privacy and cares about it. And if you contrast this with the, what the Googles and Facebooks and Baidus of this world are doing, they're forcing us to log in always with the same identifier. And what this means is that they break up context. And uh, this, is, this is the essence why it's so uneasy what they do. Mark Zuckerberg, the, the uh, uh, big boss of uh, Facebook, once said that it's, uh, having, having two identities for yourself is a lack of integrity. I find this sick. <laughs> this is really sick. So if you show in different contexts different things about yourself, he calls that a lack of integrity. Uh, of course, he says that for commercial reasons to make us think uh, 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 to, uh, to make sure that we're stupid enough to put all our sensitive data into his systems. There's a story that a couple of years ago, he bought a new house in California. He did not buy only this house. He bought all six houses around it. For what reasons? Privacy. <laughs> uh, GDPR is a big thing now in Europe. And let me briefly connect it to Irma. So GDPR is, is this thing. <clears throat> According to the GDPR, <clears throat> people have the right of access. You can go to any organization and ask, show me the information you have on me. But that organization has to be sure it's really you. <laughs> because if it's showing someone else's information to you, that's a data breach. Uh, so authentication is required there. Now, the GDPR is a law written at a very high level. It's technologically neutral, but really it requires implicitly an authentication technology that is flexible. <coughs> uh, under the GDPR, <coughs> one of the processing grounds for, uh, for uh, processing uh, uh, personal information is consent, that the individual involved agrees to this processing. Now, how do you register consent? Again, that's not uh, written down in detail, not at all actually in the GDPR. Many websites uh, do this via box ticking. You probably know this, but I mean, any website operator can generate these box ticks itself. It's, it's not at all guaranteed that it's really you uh, uh, doing this. And some of those, the things are quite sensitive if you agree to, to be enlisted in some donor register, for, for instance. Is this just a box ticking? I think we should organize these thing, kind of things in a bit more solid way, maybe via digital signatures. A third point is that the GDPR talks, one of the, the <laughs> underlying things is data minimization. <clears throat> now, and again, Irma enforces this in two ways. First of all, the attributes that you show depend on the context and can be minimal in that particular context. But also the architecture supports the uh, minimization because there are fewer parties involved, no intermediary parties, which simply form a privacy hotspot. Okay, let me come to my conclusions. <clears throat> um, a bit broader, when the internet was designed, no one cared about identity. <clears throat> it's understandable at that point, but it really creates some problems for us down the road. Um, and getting identity right is a, is a really big thing. <clears throat> it's geopolitical, it's about power relations between nations, but also between, uh, about power relations inside nations. 
the relation between the state, the public sector, and, and the civil society. I think Europe should be more active in this direction, especially since the situation is still uh, largely open. <clears throat> Governments have been largely unsuccessful in this area, uh, certainly also in the Netherlands uh, and many other uh, countries, uh, but also businesses have failed. They typically uh, want to monopolize a certain sector, impose high fees that people get unhappy about. They, they organize privacy hotspots, lock-ins. You even get discussions about backdoors, which are very, <coughs> very hot uh, this day. And my point is maybe, maybe a non-profit, community-driven and bottom-up approach may work. <coughs> okay, how... how um, <coughs> Uh, I'm repeating myself here. So again, the information flows, they, 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 they're uh, very, very sensitive. What kind of society do we want to live in? I'm making a joke here. Uh, <laughs> 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 now, but truly, IMA is to, to recapitulate. It's decentralized, it's open source, it's non-profit, it's a identity platform, in that sense it, it fits in. It's up and running and it's now being tested by various parties, uh, uh, both authentication and signing, privacy friendly, well on the way, but on a very long road, I'm well aware of. And it's a community effort. So many organizations are contributing to it in its own role. How naive am I? How naive am I? <clears throat> Is it bound to fail? Uh, certainly if you're up against the, the big powers that I'm describing here. Well, you see, some public authorities are beginning to realize that maybe they have a task in defending public values also in the digital world. Um, so you see a change of mood there. Uh, with the developments around smart cities, that varies a lot in different places, but some local authorities really try to do this in a careful way. The data protection authorities <coughs> may become tougher. Uh, uh, Article 25 of the GDPR demands uh, data protection by desi design and by default. Here's the exact phrasing. Well, exact, I left some things out. Taking, taking into account the state of the art, the controller, the controller is the party that processes the data, shall implement appropriate technical and organizational measures to implement data protection principles such as data minimization. <clears throat> and the data protection authorities could start saying to various parties, there is now this technology. This is state-of-the-art technology. Thou shalt use it. And they have the power to do this. Um, I'm certainly not here to bash uh, uh, commercial companies. What I see is some of the, some of the companies, they see that data processing, uh, personal data processing is a liability. Uh, holding all this data, they may be hacked, they may lose it, they, they may get fined in a very hefty way. Uh, and maybe it works better if they simply ask the data from the citizen or, or customer each time and then use it. Again, IMA allows to do this. Uh, a bit of advertisement, if you're curious, interested, maybe even inspired, uh, you can install the app yourself. I had the impression some people were maybe already doing it in the, in the audience. Uh, try out, uh, get some, some attributes on it. It's limited still on the, in the UK. Try out some demos. You can integrate it <laughs> into your own products if you're, if you're into this business and spread the word. <laughs> we as a foundation, we don't have a big lobby of, uh, or advertisement budget. We, we depend very much on such inspiration. We have a website that came across uh, already, Privacy by Design, dot .foundation, which I'm very happy about uh, as a website. We have a Twitter account where you can follow uh, actual developments. And I like to uh, end this way. Thank you very much. Thank you.